Hi, so in this section, we're going to calculate the measures of central tendency. And essentially, just looking at the center of our data and seeing if we can make conclusions from it. So there are three pieces to the center. There's going to be the mean, median, and mode. We're going to first discuss the mean, and then the median, and lastly, the mode. And the mode is actually one of my favorites. So. All right, let's first talk about the mean. Now, you've probably heard of the mean, meaning the average or the arithmetic mean, um, and they're pretty much all similar. So the mean, in a, it's represented by this symbol here. Um, this symbol here is actually the Greek letter mu. And it looks like a U, but it's actually a lowercase Greek letter M. And so instead of writing the word mean the, the whole time, we can write mu. And then also as if we have a sample, we can use x bar. That's another one for um, a sample mean. But in this case, um, in this class, we don't <clears throat> need to be too formal with notation because we're just, again, getting our feet wet. We're not really, we're not in a statistics class. So. Okay, so um, in order to calculate the mean, all we need to do is take the, all the observations and add them up and divide by how many we have. So the measures of central tendency will be when using quantitative data. So we need quantitative data in order to calculate the mean because it'll give us, you know, meaningful information about our sample. So if we just take the model's weights, how would we find the mean here? Well, all we have to do is add up all the observations and then divide by the number of um, model weights we have. So the mean <clears throat> and then of course we can always use mu if we wanted, right? equal to, and let's go ahead and add them up. The order doesn't matter. We just need to be able to add them all up. So we would have 110 plus 138 plus 98 plus 110 plus 85 plus 85 plus 98 plus 110 plus 138 plus 85 plus 115 plus 115 plus 85 plus 85 plus 115 plus plus 115 um, plus 110 plus 100. So you can see that this is actually, can you imagine if we had more data like 30? Like no way, right? So um, so we would have to add all these up and divide by the number of observations we had. And we had 16, right, 16 models, so go ahead and divide. So I would just put this in my calculator and add them all up, right, one by one, and then divide by 16. And I would end up getting 106.06 um, pounds. Now, I'm not going to do the calculator work because it's just arithmetic. Just, you know, you're going to take the sum here and then divide by 16. So we could say that in language, we say that there are the average weight, or um, we could say the average model's weight. is about 106.06 .06 pounds. So that's kind of how we interpret that. And that's how we would say it, right, to our friends, like, oh, the average weight would be 106. Okay, but again, with raw data, we usually aren't given the raw data. We like to see a table. So how do we find a mean from a frequency table? Well, it's going to be the same thing. Recall that the this raw data and this frequency table ha is the same, right? It just is organized. So we have four models that weigh 85 pounds, 
right? We have two models that weigh 98 pounds. So instead of writing it out in this long string of 16 pieces of data that we're adding together, we could actually be a little more constructive and like say, okay, well, if there's going to be four of these, 485s means that it's going to be four times 85. And then if I add them all up after I multiply and divide by 16, then that will work. So let's see how we would um, find the mean from a frequency table. The first part would be is multiply each weight by its frequency. Take the sum and the third part is then to divide by the number of observations. All right, so let's go ahead and do it for this problem. So then we would say the mean is equal to, and then start. So we're going to multiply each weight by its frequency, and then add them up as we go. So we're going to take 85 times 4, plus 98 times 2, plus 100 times 1, plus 110 times 4, plus 115 times 3, plus 2 times 138. And then you're going to divide in 3i, right? We're going to divide by the number of observations, which was 16. And then we would get the same value as up here, right? It's the same, it's the same mean in the same data set. It's just how we obtained the mean was different. So we get 106.06 pounds. So again, I just want to reiterate, we had the same data set, but we found the mean differently. The difference was we had raw data here, where you're just going to end up having to add and then divide. If you're given a frequency table, multiply each frequency with its category number, and then add them up, and then after you add them, divide by the number of observations. So you want to do that first, and then divide. Okay, so if we have what we call an outlier. So this is where we kind of have to talk about that not every data set is perfect, as we kind of talked discussed in the previous chapter. But these outliers are exactly what we think they are. They're out of the realm of my data. For example, if I added a weight here, let's say that was, you know, um, 300 pounds, right? And I had one model. Well, 300 seems very far from 138, my largest weight. So 300 would be an outlier because it's not within the scope of my original data. And it's same if I decided to do child modeling, the children's weight are, let's say, 30 pounds, right? Maybe a four, um, maybe not four, like a three-year-old, right? Three to four-year-old. If I added 30, well, 30 is way out of the scope of this original data, and same with the 300. And they're outliers it's because they are out of the scope of the data. Um, there is a mathematical way to calculate these. Similarly, the way we did the pie chart, right? It was We always look at it as, oh, we can just look and know what the pie chart will be. We can just look and know at our data what the outliers will be. But that's not true. We usually have a mathematical method to see exactly where the boundaries would be 
where anything outside the boundaries would be the outliers. These boundaries are called fences, but we're not going to do that in this class because that, that is too technical and that's for a statistics course. In this class, we just want you to be aware that these values exist. So if we are aware that these values exist, if I added a model that was 300 or a smaller model that was 30 pounds like a child or a toddler, I would know that these are out of the scope of my data and that these might be outliers. So we just want to make sure that we understand what outliers can do. If I add 300 to this weight, it's going to weigh this mean a little higher than 106, right? Wouldn't you agree? Because this is heavier and it's going to weigh over here um, and bring this numerator to be larger and then you get a larger quotient for that mean. If you added a smaller weight, you're now you're doing a smaller weight and then it's still adding here, right? And it's going to weigh this a just a nudge, right? But the point is, is when you have outliers, outliers can influence the values of your mean. So if a large value can influence a larger mean and a small value can influence a smaller mean. And it just wouldn't be true to the scope of the data, right? Here's your scope. When we start adding outliers, it's going to give uh, an untrue reflection of your data. So we just want to be aware and be careful that we understand that the outliers do exist and we can find boundaries in which any val data value in our set is outside these boundaries will be outliers. Um, and again, in this class, we don't really need to worry about that, but you need to know that they are out there.